I was lost and alone in a cold, dark world. No peace of mind, no freedom could I see. But little did I know I had a friend somewhere. Someone I didn't know saw some good in me. Somebody prayed for me. They had me on their mind. They sacrificed their time. They fell down on their knees and prayed for me. They had the ground that God would bring me. Welcome to South Asheboro Church of God. It's good to see you in God's house tonight. May the love of Jesus Christ abound in us all, always. Praise God. So we open in prayer. Let's continue to remember Brother and Sister Ball. As they're, they're missing Sister Taylor. They wouldn't have her back for anything because they know where she's gone. She's on home. But they still miss her. So let's pray for them and uh, this service this weekend. Also pray for the Stony Moore family. Uh, that uh, he, he passed away and was buried on Monday. Pray for his daughter, Lisa, which is Trace's sister, Trace's sister, and her, uh, Lisa's brother, Brian Moore. Uh, Brian and Lisa both need to be saved. Uh, so pray that God will save them. Also pray for my granddaughter, Casey. She needs to be saved. Uh, I told them all, I said, you know, we're all going to have to go that way one day, and we've got to make sure we know where we're going. We're all going to go by the grave unless the uh, rapture takes place. And also, let's pray for our nation. You know, our nation is in a bad, bad shape. And, you know, we're seeing more and more things happen. You know, first of all was the, uh, the pipeline shut down. Now the beef thing is affected. What else is it going to be? But, you know, we, we don't trust in all that. We trust in a living God. Praise God. Let's pray for uh, Sylvia Balkum. Uh, Sister Blanche gave this request. Said she's only has, uh, they've only given her up 48 hours to live, uh, according to the doctors. Pray for the family because they just recently lost their dad, so pray for that family. Also pray for the Singleton family. Uh, they buried Paul Day, uh, Steve's dad. He was buried today, so remember that family in prayer. You know, there's been a lot of deaths here recently, uh, and so, you know, let's pray for these people. We, if something happened to us, we want somebody praying for us, so let us do likewise. So we will stand and go to the Lord in prayer. Has anybody got a prayer request that you didn't mention? Yes. Yes, remember this. Okay, we'll stand, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, we come to you again today. We just thank you and praise you, Lord God, for your presence, Lord God, in the night.
Good to have my little buddy back there, Joshua, tonight. I have been missing him. Good to see him there tonight. Praise God. Uh, tonight, uh, confess and pray. James 5 and 16 said, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Yeah. Reading the E.M. E. M. Bounds book, Purpose in Prayer, he says, The man who truly prays gets from God many things denied to the prayerless man. And there's truth in that. Uh, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Right. That prayerless man, he's not getting anything. Let's continue to pray. And I want to say tonight, I'm just so pleased to announce that we're going to have our choir tonight. Been looking for this. If you feel comfortable, to come on up here, and we'll kind of space ourselves by families as much as possible. But come on up, and let's wear your mask up. Uh, when we get in the choir, take them off. We'll sing. Put your mask on when you go back to your seats. Get, so have the choir come on at this time. Praise God. I've been waiting for a long time to say this. Praise God.
God, it's so good to have the choir back up here. Praise the Lord. Just a little talk with Jesus. I hope you've had a little talk with him today. Praise God. I like to talk to him and say, Lord, I just love you. I thank you. I praise you for another day. Every morning I get up, I say, I thank you, Lord, that your mercies are renewed every day. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's continue to worship and get our ushers coming at this time of evening, evening offering, tithes and offering. Praise God. Hallelujah. Brother Matthew, would you pray over this time of worship? Amen. God richly bless you for your giving tonight. Also, pray for the Harper. I forgot to mention earlier in the prayer request that she had some teeth pulled today, so pray for Harper. You know, I know she's recovering tonight. Uh, at this time, let's have a special uh, Kenny and Chris going to come and minister in song. Y'all pray for them.
Praise God that they're doing a the work for the Lord at a young age. When I was about their age, I was real bashful and shy, and it was, it was hard for me to get up. I kind of outgrew it now. I guess I'll get up and speak now. Sharon says I talk all the time. <laughs> Praise God. But I'm so thankful for them coming up here doing a work for the Lord. This time I'm going to turn the service to our pastor, Brother Shelton. Amen. Amen. Give God a hand of praise tonight. Aren't you glad to be in church? This is better than being in the hospital. Thank God. There's folks in the hospital right now who would rather be here. This is better than being in a rest home. There are folks in a rest home that can't go home right now. Some are there till they leave here that would rather be in the house of God. We're blessed to be able to come to church. Amen. It's a joy to come to the house of the Lord to worship God. It's always a joy to see God's people. <clears throat> Amen. To be able to gather together. Iron sharpens iron, the Bible says. I heard a, a question raised some time ago uh, about church attendance and, you know, do, is it important? Is going to church important? And uh, one, of the, one of the people that was talking said, well, I, I believe that church attendance is, is based on the individual, an individual choice. They said some folks only go one time a year. They go twice a year. Some people go one time a week. And the man spoke up, and he said, I, I believe, too. I believe it's depending on the person, what they feel like they need. If they need to go, if they go once a week, that's good for that person. If they go twice a year, and I, I'm just sitting there thinking the whole time, you're, you're saying everything but what the Bible says. I said, you're saying everything but what the Word of God says. The Word of God tells us in, in the book of Hebrews that we ought to assemble together, and we ought to do it regularly. We need to come to church. It's important to come to church. Uh, we need that time together in prayer. We need that time together in song. We need that time to worship together, the hearing of the teaching and the preaching of the word of God. It is important. And uh, matter of fact, I believe the Bible says so much the more as you see that day approaching. And we see that day approaching. You know, the Lord's going to come. I've never been one who, you know, I've always said this. I, I believe if you're born again, you're going to go to church. If you're able to go, you're going to go to church. I believe there's going to be a desire inside of that heart to want to be there. And I've heard some of you that's even said that when you couldn't be there in that service for whatever reason, some of you have shed tears and cried and just, you know, you hated it so bad not being able to be in the house of God. It is a wonderful thing. I was talking to someone the other day, I believe it was yesterday, and we were talking about COVID and all that's happened in this past year and you know how some churches today, a friend of mine told me, he said, there's a church that I pass regularly, used to have a, just a parking lot full of cars. He said, now they don't, they don't have anybody there. I don't know whether the church is closed down, but some have closed down during this pandemic. People have quit coming. And, uh, you know, you would think now with, with things starting to loosen up, lighten up a little bit, people are able to get back doing some normal things again. Uh, you know, we were talking about how you'd think the churches would just fill up and be full, but for the most part, that's not the case. I said, for the most part, that's not the case. And uh, But I still believe Christians go to church. If they're able, they go to church. If they can't be in that service, they want to be there, I guarantee you. And uh, we're glad you're here tonight. Amen. We're going to get into the, to the Bible study again tonight. How many is enjoying the Bible study? I, I've just enjoyed this. I haven't done this in a long time. I just felt compelled to the Lord with where we are in time. I was thinking this afternoon while I was getting ready, Revelations chapter 6. Go ahead and get there, please. <clears throat> we'll read verse 3 and 4 tonight. I was thinking this afternoon, uh, you know, I was, I was born in the church of God and uh, cut my teeth on church of God pews and been raised around church all my life. And strange how that things have changed so much. What used to be preached against now is readily accepted. Or nothing's just said about it. People just do those things. And uh, I remember a time this afternoon just thinking back, reflecting in my own personal life, uh, even, even before the ministry, but especially since I've gotten the ministry, called in the ministry, uh, of, you know, preachers that I knew, preachers that 
didn't come to, you know, to sling mud, but just come to tell you the fact. Preachers that I've known that were good holiness preachers, their, their families were, were good holiness people, their, their wife, they, they had a standard about them, and they preached that, and they lived that, and they encouraged their congregations to live that way, uh, separated and live a holy life in this world and in this life to be a light. And I've watched some of them, Brother Benny, pick this world back up. And I've watched their families pick this world back up. And, and it seemed like nobody won't say anything about that today. But I'm telling you, I don't have any confidence in it. I, I, don't, I don't have any confidence in it. I even, I've even said before, I'd rather see a man who's never laid anything down than for a man to get up and preach and tell people, if you do these things, you can't go to heaven. And then they pick those things back up again. And then tell that congregation, today it's okay. I don't have any confidence in that. Amen. Think of me what you want to, old-fashioned, fanatic, whatever you want to call me. But I still believe what the Bible says, and I believe if we'll live by that Bible, I believe folks today are looking how far away, how far away they can be from God, how, how close they can live in that world but still go to heaven when they leave here. But I still believe what the Bible says, you're going to serve him, you've got to die. There's got to be a death to that, that man, and we have to be a new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. I want people to have confidence in my ministry. I, I want to have confidence in other men's ministry. When a man does that and, and, and stands on those things and those principles, those biblical principles, and then turns around and, you know, today he says, well, that's just personal convictions anymore. You can't call a personal conviction what God's word commands. There are personal convictions. There are things that God deals with me personally about. But when it comes to the commands of God's word, you can't justify that and call that a personal conviction. Can you say amen? People have picked this world back up. And now today we've had to replace that power and that anointing that we used to have in our churches. We've had to replace it with entertainment, with gimmicks, and all kinds of programs today. I'd rather have the power of God. And I'd rather have the anointing. I'd rather have the conviction in the service. Can you say amen? Rather have the power of God than to have all of the programs and all of that that this world has tricked me and deceived me in, into believing is all right. Can you see, Amen? Revelation six. I feel better. I got that off my chest. Amen. Revelation six, reading verses three and four. If you'll stand for the reading of the Word of God tonight, I'm not going to hold you a long time. We're going to get in these altars and pray. Uh, good to have my little buddy back there, Joshy, tonight. I have missed him. He's got a birthday coming up this month. Give him a hand of appreciation. We're so glad to see him. You'll say, well, he's just a little boy. He's just a nine-year-old boy. He's part of this church here. And when he's not here, we miss him. Amen? He's part of this local body, and we're glad he's here tonight. Revelations chapter 6, reading verses 3 and 4. The Bible says, and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that set thereon to take peace from the earth. You remember, the first horse, the rider, was on a white horse, and he came and brought peace. Now this second horse and rider, the Bible said, the horse was red, uh, is going to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. First white horse rider comes with the promise of peace. Remember, he comes with a bow, but no arrows. He's going to ride on a white horse with that bow, and he's going to promise peace. But now, after a time, the red horse rider is going to appear. And with him, he's going to bring, the Bible said, is going to take peace away going to cause men to kill one another. May God add his blessings to his red word tonight. You can be seated for a little while this evening. Glad to have you in the house of God. Good to have those watching online tonight. We don't want you to get too comfortable watching online. We want you to get back in the house of God. Amen. We talked about last Wednesday night about that white horse rider, who that was. That is the Antichrist. Uh, who's going to come, and the world's going to be brought under his power. 
They're going to be brought and, and going to just be mesmerized by this man. We said he's going to be an imitation Christ. He's going to be a false Messiah. Yet so many in this world are going to put their hopes in him. They're going to put the hope of their future in this man, believing that he's going to make everything better in this world. Brother Chart has already alluded to the fact of how bad things are now in this country, not just around the world, in this nation. Things are bad. There, there's turmoil going on right now. And uh, there's an upheaval in this nation today. And when this, this man comes on the scene, they're going to place their future in him and their hopes in him. They're going to fall prey to a man who's going to claim to bring worldwide peace. Something unheard of today. Peace around the world uh, but his rule is going to prove to bring nothing more than destruction and death and devastation to this world. We know that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, according to John 14 and 6. But this Antichrist, this man's going to be a dangerous detour into lies and deceit and ultimately death. The white horse rider is the Antichrist. The world's going to love him. They're going to worship him. They're going to fall down before him. He's going to be the most wonderful thing that they have ever known. I'm glad I'm not looking for another Messiah. I have found the greatest man that's ever been. When I met Jesus Christ, no man's ever done in my life for what Jesus has done. This man's going to be an imitation. This man's going to be false. But I'm glad to know the way, the truth, and the life, the Son of a living God. When we come to verses 3 and 4 here, and we look at the second seal being opened, the Bible said the second horse and that rider is going to appear. The horse is red. We know that red's the color of fire. Red's also the color of blood. And fire and blood both accompany war. What these scriptures that I read to you tonight describe is going to be a war of unprecedented proportions. The Bible said in verse 4, Power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. Now, we know that men have been killing one another since that Garden of Eden. Uh, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, we know the first murder happened there when Cain rose up against his own brother Abel and, and slew him. The Bible said they were standing there talking in a field uh, and Cain rose up against him and killed his own brother. His blood soaked the earth there. Since that first murder, since that time, uh, there has been countless murders. Matter of fact, today, around this world, there have been many people's lives have been taken by the hands of another person. Uh, since that time, there have been many wars. Since that first murder in the garden, many lives have been lost. This war, uh, we talk about war, and we, we think about what comes with war, but this war is going to be different. This war is going to be different than any other war in the past. It is a war that's going to be on a worldwide scale. The peace that's been promised and instituted by that Antichrist, that white horse rider, is going to fail. The world then is going to be plunged into a time of bloodshed and a time of destruction at a level that this world has never experienced before. Now, our world has known its, its share of warfare and death. In the 3,400 recorded years of history, there have only been 268 years in, the, in which the whole world at one time was at peace. That's less than 8% of our world history. War is a common event. Even today, there is wars. There is threats of wars going on right now. There's violence on nearly every continent on this earth. We live in a nation that, you know, uh, certainly there could be a race war that could break out. We're on the verge of that. There are places in other, other nations around the world where there's civil war going on, places like Africa, where tribes are killing other tribes there. They talked about this last election, if you want to call it an election. 
I believe in an election it takes people voting and counting the votes and whoever has the most votes wins, if you want to call it that. But nevertheless, there, there was talks of a civil war breaking out right here in this nation. And those, those talks are still on the table. That's not something they've buried even yet. The very foundation of society has been built on wars. Even when a nation is at peace, that peace is often maintained by the threat of war. So war is something that has been going on for, for countless ages. But the Bible tells us that when the tribulation comes, all the wars in the past combined together are going to pale in, 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 into insignificance in the face of wars that's going to take place in that tribulation period. Jesus warned us that the end times would be a time of war. Matthew 24, 6 and 7, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. Jesus told us that there would be uh, times of war in the end times. He also warned us to beware of any peace treaty devised by a man. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 3, For when they shall say peace and safety, when leaders are going to say everything is looking wonderful, we've got everything worked out, Everything looks great on the horizon. The Bible warns us here when they say that. Uh, he said, Then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail cometh upon a woman with child, uh, and they shall not escape. I I'm telling you, try as they might, uh, man simply cannot forge a lasting peace. All of their peace efforts uh, no matter how hard they try, no matter what neg negotiation tactics they use, uh, sometime sooner or later those, those talks are going to fall apart and that peace is not going to last. You remember when Donald Trump was, in our, was our president and how that, you know, he caught so much, you know, <laughs> so much from the media on everything, you know, if you want to be honest about it, but especially with North Korea and his visits with Kim Jong-un. Am I saying that right? Kim Jong-un? You know what I'm talking about, that leader in North Korea. And he went over there and he, you know, had talks with him and, you know, things that happened between them were unprecedented, things that's never happened before in the history, uh, you know, with peace talks. And, you know, they stopped test firing missiles and those things during that time. But as soon as Trump was, you know, out of office again, I'm telling you, North Korea is already kicking up their heels again. Hardest men try to keep peace, you know, it always fails. And the reason is, uh, it's because sin will not allow it. Sin's not going to allow a constant peace. And certainly the devil's not going to allow a constant peace. Both sin and Satan are in the business uh, of destroying. They're in the business of destruction. They destroy sin and Satan. They destroy individual lives. They destroy homes. They destroy marriages. They destroy families and churches and children. They destroy nations. They destroy communities. They destroy everything sin and Satan touches. Eventually, it will destroy. There's a breakdown in the home today. Did you realize there's, there's as much divorce in the church as there is outside in the world today? Homes are, are breaking down. There, there's a breakdown in the leadership in the home. You know, I've said this before, and i got to move on here. Dear God, I've said this before. Where are the men today in the home? Where are the fathers and the husbands that will lead that home the way that they're supposed to? In, in most churches, not all, but, that, but the, the norm in most churches uh, is on a Sunday morning, you'll see that mother there with those children She's had to get up early. She's had to get those children ready for church while that husband lays in the bed. He's out somewhere playing golf. He's out somewhere, you know, at the house doing something else. And that mother's left to get those kids, load them up, get them to the house of God. Very seldom, it's not normal, 
to see a man go to church and the wife and kids stay home. It's not normal to see the husband take the kids and the wife not go to church. There is a, there's a letdown. There's a failure. We've got Father's Day coming up. And a lot of men are going to stand up around the world uh, and be celebrated that day. Who you know They know how to make that baby, but they don't know how to raise that child and raise that family in the house of God. Can you say amen? Satan and sin always destroy. They will not allow continued peace. Everything they touch will ultimately be destroyed. The Bible said that Jesus said in John 10 and 10 that the thief cometh but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Men can try to forge a lasting peace, but because of sin, because of Satan, it never lasts. There will be no lasting peace on this earth until ultimately the Prince of Peace comes. When Jesus Christ comes to this earth again, when he comes back in the second part of that second coming, then we're going to know peace on this earth as it was originally there in the Garden of Eden before sin. Only Jesus can give true peace. Now, as children of God, I know that we live in a world that, you know, we don't know what peace is even in this country. There's always something going on. There's always some kind of turmoil going on in this nation. You don't believe it, just watch the news about 10 minutes. But as children of God, even in, the, in a world like we're living in now, I'm glad we can still have peace in our hearts. He said, let not your heart be troubled. We can be surrounded by all kinds of things going on in this world. But Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world give I unto you, not as the world gives us, but the peace that surpasses all understanding. So even in a world surrounded by sin and sorrow and Satan and sickness, uh, the child of God can still know the peace of God uh, down deep in our hearts. Can you say amen? Verse 4 says, Power was given to him that set their own to take peace from the earth. Now, it's hard to imagine a world where there's absolutely no peace anywhere. Sister Shelton and I went to the mountains last year with Brother and Sister Albright. Lord willing, we're going to go again this year. And, I, you know, I, I love to go to the mountains. It's just my favorite place on the earth. I'm going to get away for a vacation. I love to go to those mountains. And uh, it's just, I've said it before, it's so peaceful there. It's hard to imagine a world where there's no peace anywhere, where everywhere that you go, and I know you go to those places, there's, there's still people who act up, there's people who, you know, they're still doing sinful things, but there's just something about being in the mountains, it's just a peaceful place, is that right? They're on vacation, but we can, it's hard to imagine a world where there's no peace anywhere, but this is what's being described in, in verse 4. In that time, every corner of the earth is going to blaze with the fires of war, and every corner of this earth is going to know the horror of bloodshed and death. There's not a place on this earth during that tribulation uh, that's going to escape this coming war. The Bible said this writer, is, he comes, he takes peace from the earth, and he's given a great sword. The, the, the sword here that the Bible refers to is a a short sword that was carried by a Roman soldier in those days. The short sword was one that they used when they were planned to do hand-to-hand -hand combat. The image here is, is one of men rising up against men, men going head-to-head -head in combat, nation against nation, in a global war that's going to bring death from a warfare at, a, at an extraordinary level. When that Antichrist first appears, he's going to appear as a man of peace. He's going to be hailed as a man of peace. If anybody will get a Nobel Peace Prize, he will be first in line. I guarantee you that. He's going to be worshipped because of what he's able to do to begin with, the peace he's able to bring. Soon after he's given the reins of power, I'm telling you that wolf is going to step out of his sheep costume. He's going to step out of that, that hiding and portray what he really is. He's going to display his true colors. After men have elevated him to a place of prominence and a place of power, 
Then he's going to demand absolute dominion over all of this earth. He's going to demand absolute worship. He's going to demand absolute devotion. Now, we know men, rulers like Kim Jong-un, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, I don't know whether you know this or not, but, but they worship him as deity. He is a god to them. I believe somebody told me yesterday, I believe maybe Anna Grace told me, that after he dies, he's still going to be the leader of that country. He don't have a son to take his place. They worship those leaders as gods, like they did the pharaohs back in that day. They're, they're worshiped like they are deity. Well, when the Antichrist steps out of his costume, he's going to demand those rulers to bow down before him and those nations to worship him as God. Amen. Many of these nations are going to rebel against that reign of the Antichrist at that time. Now, can you imagine? Can you imagine Donald Trump when he was president? Can you imagine him standing up, uh, you know, on the world stage and saying that all of you, every one of you rulers, are going to bow down and worship me now? You want to talk about an immediate war take place. Can you imagine Joe Biden if Joe Biden were to stand up, if he can remember where he is, can you imagine him standing up, reading off a teleprompter? Well, you might as well say amen. amen. Can you imagine him standing up among the world leaders today and saying, fellas, I've got an announcement I want to make to you. I am a God, and you're all going to bow down and worship me. You're going to go back and tell every person in your nation that from now on, I'm going to be the one they're going to worship. I'm telling you, war would break out immediately, either that or laughter. But if they thought he was serious, and he demanded that, and he, he come with a threat of war against them now, they're going to fight back. They're going to retaliate. This is what's going to happen. Some of those nations are going to rebel during that time. Uh, against that reign of the Antichrist, and there's going to be a war going to break out on this earth, a global war. The war is going to experience war on a scale that it's never witnessed before. Now, how was it, you know, around in those days, but in the, those years of the World War II, some 50 million people died around the war, world during that time. But that number is going to fall far short compared to the billions who are going to die during the wars that are going to rage uh, during the tribulation period. America is not going to go unscathed. America is going to be involved in that war. She's going to feel the impact of what's taking place around this war world. During this war that's going to happen as this red horse white rider comes to bring war, it's believed that Russia and Iran, Syria, and her other allies are going to try to invade Israel in that time in fulfillment of Ezekiel chapter 38 and chapter 39. According to the Bible, their armies are going to be defeated by divine intervention. I read a headline somewhere, I can't remember where it was, it may have been yesterday or today, uh, where this, you know, this little war that just broke out recently between Israel and Hamas, uh, they, it was in a, a newspaper article, I, you can help me if I'm wrong about this, but I believe I read this correctly, that, that some of those that were part of that firing missiles at Israel, they said it's almost as if their God, talking of Israel, that their God redirected those missiles to rescue them. And in that time, during that war that's going to happen, Israel's going to come under attack again. There's going to be divine intervention. The Bible talks about fire and brimstone and plagues and fear and confusion and a great earthquake uh, that's going to be used to defeat those invaders against God's people, Israel. The Bible said it's going to take seven years to burn the weapons of war. In Ezekiel 39, verses 9 and 10, the Bible said, And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth, and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows and the arrows, and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. That talks about how, how much... Uh, how much, that, how great a scale that war is going to be at that time. And all the weapons that's going to be brought against the nation, God's people, Israel. So that they shall take no wood out of the field, neither cut down any out of the forest, uh, for they shall burn the weapons with fire. 
They shall spoil those that spoiled them and rob those that robbed them, saith the Lord God. The Bible says it's going to take seven months to bury the dead who died during this invasion in Ezekiel 39 and 12. And seven months shall the house of Israel be bearing of them that they may cleanse the land. This conflict that's going to take place during the early part of that tribulation is not going to end with this great war. But wars are going to continue to rage around the globe until Jesus Christ comes again in all of his glory and in all of his power. Can you see, man? Now, it's hard for us to imagine a world that's consumed by war. How many of you here in this congregation tonight have lived through a time of war? You didn't, you didn't go to war, but you've lived through a time of war. Uh, in my time, I've been on this earth 50 years, and in my time on the earth, before I got here, the Vietnam War was going on, and I believe it was winding down when I got here. There was still some, some going on, but not as great as it was. You know, there's been the Gulf War since I've been, there's been a few wars taking place on foreign soil that we fought in, uh, but as far as my time here on this earth, 50 years, there's never been a war here in, in this country, on our soil here. Has anybody experienced that? Anybody old enough to know that? I don't think you are. Nevertheless, there have been wars that we have fought in, this country has fought in, but the closest thing we've experienced to a war in this country was those attacks at 9-11, when we were attacked by terrorists, uh, but we didn't fight that war here on this soil, we went to where they were, and, and we, you know, we attacked them that way. My time here, I've never seen a war in, in my lifetime here in the United States of America. Matter of fact, not since that Civil War, I believe it was 1861, correct me if I'm wrong about that, historians. Uh, ha, since that civil war, has America experienced war firsthand? Since then, with the exception of Pearl Harbor, our, war, our wars have been fought on foreign soil. They've been fought in other countries. Now, I said that to say this, we don't really know what war is. We don't really understand what that is. We can see about it on TV. We can read about it in newspapers. We can see other countries being bombed and all those things. But we don't really understand that until it's happened to us. Is that right? We don't understand the horrors of war. We don't understand the wholesale slaughter and the utter destruction that always accompanies warfare. My grandfather, Mama, you can help me with this. I was trying to remember back today. My grandfather, my mother's dad, he was in World War II. That's right. Is that right? He fought in World War II, and uh, he witnessed some of his good friends get killed over there. He survived that war. He came home, but she can tell you, to this day, he's, he's gone on now to be with the Lord, but to this day, when he came home, he was never the same. It, it did something to him. From that time forward, I believe, I believe I'm right about this, he couldn't watch war movies. Anything like that, it would, it would just tear him up. He, it done something to his nerves it, to see that destruction uh, and what it done to many of those men who've gone and fought in those kind of wars. But we don't understand that. But one day this nation will. I said one day this nation is going to know what that is during that tribulation, if not before, war is going to come to this country. War is going to take place in America. During that tribulation, nation is going to rise against nation. There'll be race wars during that time. There'll be class wars during that time. There will be religious wars that's going to consume this war world. That white horse rider is going to come. The saints of God are going to be gone. Those that were ready for that rapture, we're going to be in heaven celebrating, rejoicing. The Antichrist is going to step into power. There's going to be turmoil during that time, but he's going to come. He's going to sign that seven-year treaty with Israel that promises peace to them and the nations around them, and he's going to promise peace to this world. I'm telling you, if a man can take that office and says and promises, I can bring peace to your nation, I can bring peace to your community, I can bring peace to your city, most people are going to vote for that man. Is that right? They're going to vote for that man. And he's going to offer that kind of peace worldwide. They're going to vote for him. They're going to be excited about him. They're going to applaud him. But then he, the reality is going to set in. And wars are going to follow this, this man of Satan, this Satan's superman, so to speak. In that time, peace will be an elusive concept. 
There will be no peace when this red horse rider appears. The world today is a powder keg. We're ready. This world's ready for war. Is that right? We're, 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 this, this world is ready to explode right now. It's ripe for war. And one day this world is going to explode just the same. So my advice here tonight before we come and pray to all of us, each one of us, my advice is to make sure that we're saved first and foremost. That is the most important thing that, that, you know, in this life is to make sure that we are prepared to go to heaven. Make sure that we're living right. Make sure that we're in love with the Lord. Make sure that we're being faithful to God. I've said it many times. If you mess up, get it right. Be quick to get it right. Get up and keep going with God. Make sure that you're saved so that we can avoid all this that's going to take place. So that we can avoid this, this red horse and that rider of war and all the things that's going to happen after the rapture happens. The church is going to be gone. When I say this, uh, you know, I, don't, I can't emphasize it enough. But in that time, this, all hell is going to be unleashed upon this world. Uh, the United States is not going to escape that. They're going to know the pains of that time and the people that live in this country. Our families that are lost, they're going to experience this. And many of them are going to die during that time. Many of them are going to be killed during that time. So the safest place is still in Jesus Christ. That is the only safe place today. You can have, you can have gun permits. You can lock your doors at night. Put alarms on your house. Lock your doors in your car when you go out. You do all those safety precautions, safety measures. But I'm telling you, the only safe place in this life is in Jesus Christ. Can you say praise the Lord? When that second seal is open, this world's going to be stripped of peace. And it's going to be plunged headlong in the world into war. We don't want to be here for that time. We don't want to be here to experience the, 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 the turmoil that's coming. We want to be in heaven with King Jesus. Can you give him a hand of praise tonight? <laughs> Sister Albright, if you'll come and play something softly, please. We want to make sure that we're there with the Lord when all of this happens. This is not some kind of fairy tale. This is not some kind of make-believe. This is not just some kind of something somebody's come up with, you know, just sitting around. But this is the word of God. This is what the Bible tells us is going to take place. And I'm glad the Lord shows us there is an escape plan. There is a way to escape this. It's going to come. That is through the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. To love him, to live for him, to serve him. There's never been a greater time to serve the Lord than right now. I've never, in my short time on this earth, I've never seen anything. And I believe you'll agree with me. I've never seen anything like what we're seeing take place on this earth. You don't have to go around the world just in this country. I've never seen anything take place like what's happening right now. This month, June, is Gay Pride. Is that right? Isn't that right? In this Gay Pride Month? I know it is. Because I remember going to the beach a couple years ago on vacation with our family, all of our family, and going to the outlets. And on the, on the doors, on the glass entrance, or the glass fronts of the building, they had the rainbows. And they were, had, you know, gay pride awareness and uh, gay awareness and all those things. I won't tell you, you can call it gay what you want. There's nothing happy about it. There's nothing funny about it. It's still queer. And that word queer, queer means strange, odd. It is not natural. I've never seen a time where that, listen, there, there have always been people that have, have, have got caught up in that. If you read back to the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, that was going on then. That's always happened, always been, since sin came into this world the way it did. But I'm telling you, there never has been a time in this country where people are not just coming out of the closet, they're knocking the closet doors down. I told Sister Shelton the other night, I said, I get so tired of that stuff being shoved in my face that I have to accept that, that sinful lifestyle. I get tired of that. I told her, I said, Christians have hardly any rights in this country. You, you can't pray in the name of Jesus anymore. 
You can't call yourself a Christian much anymore. But if you, you call yourself a homosexual or lesbian, you know, we've had former presidents that applauded people like that. What a wonderful thing it is for somebody to come out that way. I'm telling you, friend, every nation that supported it is no more. Is no more. We need to pray for revival in this country. We need to pray for revival in the church. And then when revival happens in the church, we pray it can break out in this country. And this country can come back to God the way she's supposed to. This country is on the verge of collapse. It's on the verge of destruction. But I believe before it happens, we're going to get out of here. And we're going to go be with the Lord. Can you say amen? I want you to come tonight if you're able. You want to make a, an altar there at your pew. If you want to come to these altars. Let's come and pray tonight. We want to keep praying for our lost family members. We want to pray for revival in our churches. We want to pray for the sick. We want to pray for the hurting. I was over here this afternoon getting ready. And I thought about our pamphlets out there. I told you that the one on anxiety and depression, those things, that, that's a real thing that people battle. And maybe all people battle it sometime or another. They deal with those things. But I told you how every one of those pamphlets were gone and others were still there. And I thought this afternoon it's going to get worse. The anxieties are going to get worse in this country. The fears are going to get worse in this country. I believe the depression and the oppression is going to get worse. I'm not trying to be gloom and doom, all gloom and doom here tonight. I'm just telling you, I believe the things are going to get worse before they ever get better. And so we have to stay close to the Lord and serve Him. And find our peace in Him. Find our hope in this man called Jesus. Let's pray tonight, please.